I think we're going to get started when everybody's ready. So I'm RJ McDowell, and uh, this is Josh Timer, and we're going to be talking about Windows Rootkit development, Python prototyping to kernel level C2. And uh, so I'm a senior consultant at Ernst & Young, and I'm on their attack and penetration team, so we do like red teams and all sorts of different stuff. Um, before that, I was in security monitoring, that's on the blue team side, and then, uh, you know, computer science, that sort of thing. I'm Joshua Timer. I'm also with EY. I'm also based out of the Advanced Security Center, uh, primarily doing a attack and penetration, um, and then assisting on some incident response jobs as well. So we're, we're both we're both primarily red teamers, and and um, as we go through the testing and as we go through this process, we run into a number of issues. Right? It, ideally, we're we're stuck between uh, trying to get to certain trophies on the network and at the same time trying to minimize our footprint. And so uh, this is something that pretty much everyone struggles with. Um, regardless of the tool, Metasploit, Empire, Cobalt Strike, you're going to have either network traffic, event logs, or authentication activity. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's uh, like some of the things so, like network traffic, obviously like, you know, IES is Netflow data, you know, one of the things that uh, can get people caught oftentimes is, you know, if you pull down like a, you get a stager going and then it pulls down the second payload and it's just default and it's not encoded or it's not, you know, encrypted or anything. Uh, that can be like issues. And then just common, common non-encrypted traffic. You know, so like if we have, you know, some sort of like command and control, you know, there's like a, or it can go on that. Event logs too for logins. And one of the big things now is like, you know, anomalous activity. You know, on the network, we see a bunch of logins from this one IP, but that's not typical for our environment, so what's going on? Yeah. I'd say most of our clients are aggregating their Windows event logs at this point, right? So as we go through and and we perform the activities, or the, the attack and pin activities, we're creating logs. And even if you were to clear out the logs, what you end up with are, um, you know, abnormalities where a host is not reporting its logs and so as a result of that it looks you know it, it looks bizarre and and warrants additional scrutiny yeah um. so I ideally what we'd like to do <laughs> is uh, a, as we went through, as we go through the the process of attacking a network we want to try to hide our network connections. So that is on host-based firewalls and, and wherever there's logs, that wouldn't show up. Um, additionally, we, we would like to try to bypass certain firewall restrictions that are on, in place on certain hosts. Uh, from a uh, diversion perspective, you know, to, if you're in, in some sort of purple team environment where there's a blue team actively uh, hunting you, uh, as you're going through the process of testing, uh, it'd be nice to try to divert their activity, uh, show false positives, show, uh, essentially uh, try to uh, move the attention away from the attack and, and to something that isn't necessarily um, related to us. And then, uh, and then finally, you know, whatever platform that we're using, we'd like to weaponize it for our common tools where we're trying to gather credentials and everything. And one of the things, we're going to have like some really awesome demos and everything, so just hold through to the boring part until we get to that, because uh, we'll, we'll dive into demos and it'll be less text and more hands-on, so, <laughs> yeah. So, but that's kind of the thing is like, so since we've run into these issues, we want to, we were just kind of, you know, thinking, how can we get around this, you know, how can we, you know, what can we do that isn't actively being done possibly, or, um, you know, like, can we do something different? You know, because typically that's kind of the trend is like, oh, we'll do, do like one thing. Like, you know, it used to be like, I'd say blank, you know, it's, you know, so there's like a trend. And sometimes you go, you go back. So we're like, what can we do that maybe is a little different uh, to get around things? Um, so it's really kind of starts out with understanding how does, you know, Windows work as far as like the network uh, stack. And so the Windows filtering platform, it's, there's, a, there's an API set that uh, Win, or Microsoft provides to allow us to interact with the network stack um, the way that it does. 
And so, for instance, um, the Windows, you know, firewall, antiviruses, a bunch of different stuff, they actually use these APIs to do that. So Windows Advanced Firewall, it uses these API calls. It's like a low level. And so the WPF is the newest, it's the standard. So like those APIs are what's being used. It's replaced, you know, the transport driver interface, like all those ones that were just like predecessors to this. And so understanding that it's, you know, blocking stuff at a, you know, a, at that level with these APIs and have access, okay, what's the simplest solution for us to employ something that we can use uh, to leverage that same low level control over the network traffic and then also what can we do with it? <clears throat> and, and this is really where WinDivert and PyDivert come into play. So there's, uh, I, I, yeah, from our perspective, you know, uh, how do we rapidly prototype something that we can use at, on an engagement how, how do we see what we can take advantage of, what we can spoof, what we can change? Um, and, and so there are current libraries out there, uh, primarily WinDivert, which is, it, it's an open source, it's an open source trusted and signed network driver, so you could actually sign this driver yourself as well. Um, and it takes, it, it allows you to take control of certain uh, network packet, uh, processing away from the host operating system um, and and it's capable of allowing you to to really manipulate that traffic. PyDivert is really just a wrapper around WinDivert and so there's a number of tools that are currently using this. Any Anything from FireEyes, uh, you know, net, uh, fake net NG where they're doing, they're spinning up a fake network in order to do malware analysis to um, while well, the list is there, this is off of WinDivert's site. So uh, e essentially, this looked like it was something that we could use, that we could interact with, to to try to get to the the underlying um, operating system at at the kernel level. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I mean, just to kind of add to to the project, it's it's legitimate. Like you know, that's why we kind of put that list there. Is that you know, when we get into basically how we're able to leverage it for our activities and things that we need to do, you know, we definitely don't want just, oh, hey, let's just block that driver. Because one, it's open source, so anybody that gets, you know, for like even for Windows 10, you get a EB, you know, code signing certificate, you know, it's going to be different. And so well, yeah, and simply I, blocking the driver isn't, uh, you know, don't do that because legitimate applications use well, it. Well, I, I think it, and, and going forward, so, I, you know, there's, there's a user mode and kernel mode, and typically you haven't been able to interact with the kernel with the kernel mode drivers up until around 2012, where you can now actually, as an individual, obtain a, an SPC um, and actually sign uh, kernel mode software. So you, it, it WinDivert is one thing, but at this point, you can you can ultimately take yeah. your own and sign whatever you need in order to interact with kernel mode drivers. So WinDivert is primarily the two pieces that we're using are the the uh, WinDivert sys file, which is really a kernel mode driver, and then the DLL, which is the user mode library that interacts with that kernel um, that kernel mode driver. Yeah. So it's really awesome because now we have access. So we can have user you know, mode code that's interacting with kernel mode uh, stuff. So it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. So I think we'll just go ahead and hop into a demo. We're, you, we're going live to. here. So Yeah, we were going to make videos and we were like, ah, whatever. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, okay. And so the first thing... Uh, that we want to look at is okay so like let's say that we got on this box and you know we want to come back because in a lot of cases you know in, in a lot of environments what typically has to happen is that oh they want us to see if we can get to a specific segment of their network they want to see if we can get to this objective and usually it comes down to okay we have to go through a jump box and then we have to get to that network or a series of jump box so um, that was kind of, you know, like one of the inspirations, like, okay, how can we, you know, do this where we have to, you know, log in multiple times, it's going to be weird traffic, you know, so that's just kind of the thing, but, um, so, 
So we've 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 written a a, a Python prototype using these the wind divert and we've compiled it to an executable. Um, all of this will be open source and you can make your own executable. Um, and so th this will be up on the Git, GitHub page. But essentially what RJ is showing right now is, is the fact, you know, if you're on a machine and you log in, uh, you're, you're creating event logs associated with the, your activity, right? So, right. I yeah. mean, this, this is, it's not only creating authentication logs, but it's showing up um, from a network perspective. Um, yep. And so, like, this program that you can probably see on the desktop, that's just the, the you know, that's the binary. And so, uh, we use, use Pi Installer with a spec file that was a little bit of get working, but now it's flawless. So, if you go to compile it and you're modifying the spec file, it's probably doing something wrong. The instructions are on the GitHub page. Yeah. Let's, let's go ahead. Why don't you show them the, yeah. the and logging I'm, platform? Logging. Yeah. So, what I'm going to go ahead and do is kind of show, like, so. One of the things that you know, we use a lot on engagements are just like, you know, like Impact, it's a great tool. We can use like WMI exec, PS exec, different things like that, just to get, you know, remote access. So if we want to go ahead and get on this box and we just want to use PS exec, for instance, oh, let me make sure that, that it's logging. Okay, good, yeah, it is logging. So we can easily get a shell, who am I, network system, and then we are on that box. So 146, that's the target machine. So when we go through the demos, that's, that's going to be the target, is 146. Yeah. All right. So this is the box that he's essentially PS exec into, right? So, and it doesn't really matter what you're doing, um, RDP, PS exec, whatever. This traffic is showing up. <laughs> Uh, from a networking perspective, it's showing up um, from an, a, logging perspective. a logging perspective. And, and if so you do, you know, you net the yeah. Too. And just to, like show, like we have an active connection. So the 147 attacker machine, 146 is the target, and it shows we have an active connection. So if we come back over here, it's like the last 15 minutes or so, you can see that in the logs, administrator logged in from this. IP address. So our attacker machine will show up in the event logs, right? <clears throat> so, boom, it's like, oh, hey, we've never seen this IP log into our jump box. What's it doing? Bam. So, so he, he's exited out of, that was, that was the previous connection. That was, those were the network connections that, you know, showed up. So now we're going to run this tool that interacts um, at the, at a, at a driver level, a kernel level driver. Just to see level. if we can maybe Just to get see if there's stuff. some ways that we can bypass some of the typical stuff that would show up in the logs. And so I think we probably want to make it a service just because you know, we're not going to like run it yeah, so the command of, line, right? One of the ways you can, one, one thing you can do if you, want the, if you want the executable to persist is really to, to turn it into a service on the, on the host operating system, right? Um, there's a number of ways for persistence. It, it's it's arbitrary, but um, go ahead and yeah. And I'm gonna copy and paste just so there's no issues, because <laughs> we know how demos go. Yeah. Yeah, copied. <laughs> but if we look at it, we're basically just creating a service, and I'm actually gonna give it a different name because that one might actually exist. We'll call it, you know, just Derby Con. Oh yeah, yeah. Derby Red Sales. Okay. So, so what he's done is on, on the victim machine, this assumes that you have some sort of access on the victim machine and you're trying to persist. Uh, so what he's done is started a service on the victim machine. Yeah. So, and so there's the service. It, it, it says, you know, from when you're listing your services, it, it's essentially saying, go ahead and start the service. Obviously we've, we've, we've created that service. And so, um, yeah. I think we can actually do the net star, right? If not, we'll do it from the GUI, but I'm pretty sure this works. And so, so. yeah, so like you notice that we got an error, right? But if everything went smoothly, let's just see what happens. And so 
There's actually, uh, inside this program, we've actually built in a, a back door. You want to go ahead and show like what ports are listening right now? Here, actually. So the, in, the, in the options, you're listing. Yeah. So as you can see, port 22, just like to be able to, is not listening, right? So there's no service listening on port 22. Somebody opened this up, nothing's on 22, but we ran our uh, program, we're connected, let's see. Okay, we're system supposedly, let's what, see what box we're on. What's your RIP? 46. So you're the on target. the victim machine. So. And this is a TCP connection, so does it now show our active connection now that we're connected? Does anybody see 147 listed? No. So we're able to maintain a stateful TCP connection without it being listed here. Uh, Shut the logs. Like yeah. And so let's go ahead and see, were there any logs associated whenever we made a connection? No. Because these are from... Nothing new showed up um, in terms of... 12 and it's 17. Okay. So, it, it gets, gets better. better. <laughs> it's be so, so the, the next thing, so obviously the Windows firewall is also using this, right? So if you have a host based firewall that is blocking certain ports from actually being able to uh, from services being able to communicate over them, it doesn't really matter. So, so if we were to turn on the Windows firewall, it wouldn't make a difference. We could pick whatever port is being blocked and ride over that port. Every um, port could be blocked and we could still connect to it. And nothing as, would show up. As long as the log. executable is, yeah, as long as you've run that. Executable. Oh, and remember how we started the service? Let's see, let's see if it shows that it's actually started. No. <laughs> so we have, like, we started as a service. It doesn't show that it started. We're listening on a port. It doesn't show that it's listed. We have a valid TCP connection, and it's not listed. That's, we're happy about that. You want to go back to me? Sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that later. So just to recap, you know, we're, what we're trying to do is handle the, the, the connections manually and then divert the packets away from the stack and then manipulate them uh, in, in a manner that we want uh, to use them. So ultimately what we're trying to do is limit what's observable by the, by the operating system and at the same time try to hide the network activity that's a, that would be reported. Um, it, it allows you to to bypass firewalls and interact over a, bl a block port really without the restriction as long if you're using the, the Windows Advanced Firewall. So the, the native Windows Firewall on, the, on a host. So a lot of those, a lot of those connections are, uh, or a lot, of, a lot of that network traffic really would have to be detected at, from a network appliance. It wouldn't necessarily be something that could be reported from the host. NetFlow data, oh, I think I'm fine. I'm sorry, what? Oh, yeah, no, it doesn't matter if it's running or not. And, and the reason why is because it's using the same APIs. So when we take the packet off the stack, do whatever we want with it, we send it back, we're, at, we're operating on the same level. And that's why it goes through. Yeah, kind of going back to this, I mean, pr pretty much that, that Windows firewall is operating at the kernel mode driver. It's using the same. Yeah, go ahead. You know, if we, like, we haven't implemented, like, the driver that we're implementing, we're really taking advantage of, like, specifically for this, is really focusing at a network level. You know, but we can, you know, definitely explore other venues, and this can definitely be extended with other drivers as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so. And just from, like, a 
development perspective, we kind of wanted to show what's kind of the logic behind this, how are we able to do this, what's the secret sauce. So There is none. <laughs> well, it's just like a real big pain is really what it is. And so what we ended up doing is like since, I mean, if, if anybody's used Scapy, which is awesome, it works really well, except that, you know, you're not able to modify packets and transit, you're able to just kind of get a copy. And so with this, it's kind of like Scapy, but you can modify it before it goes out. And so what we, were, what we did is we implemented TCP manually. Okay, so like we have like basically, it's not gonna be RFC compliant, okay? But it's, it's under active development and it works. So like the client that we're using is using Python sockets. So it's able to maintain a valid TCP connection calculates, you know, the act, you know, the sequence numbers, all that. And so, like, you can just kind of see a code snippet here. This can definitely be uh, uh, looked at as almost like a state. I mean, it's not a state machine, but it's, we're basically trying to keep state. And so we have records that show us, so like, if someone makes a TCP connection, we can then see, okay, is there a valid connection for that? And we have, <clears throat> you know, code that's basically handling each, you know, use case to keep that connection. A lot. Good there. Yeah. Can you give me more detail? Please repeat the question. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what happens? Okay, so basically he wants to know, or would we be suppressing packets? Like, base, I think it's, the question is, if you're monitoring traffic with maybe like Wireshark, TCP, Denver, like that, on the compromised host, would you still see the packets? I'm not sure, we haven't tested it. I wouldn't want to say yes or no just because we haven't looked at it. But I will say that what happens is we take it off the stack and we put it in, and so like whenever they're using like, you know, uh, WinPCAP, for instance, and it goes into promiscuous mode, it's able to see those packets, right? So like we can like see that, but from like a host level, it's not making those. And we're going to go into basically like some other ways to even break those connections too. But is that? Yeah. Sorry. Hey, it's it's open source. We, we, we can, can test it. We can test like, yeah, it after can... if you if you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So goal two, we really like some tools that uh, require authentication. Again, Packet's really good, it's very powerful. Sometimes we have to remote desktop. There's been some cases where yeah, it's Yeah, and, be and a lot of in industrial control systems networks, right. SCADA networks, a lot of times they'll block everything but only allow RDP through for an operator, right? So you're forced to use something um, that you wouldn't normally use, right? You're, you're forced to try to obtain the credentials that you need key log someone, pull what you need, and, and then make that connection to prove that you have that access to that, to that uh, restricted host. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do was try to uh, use those tools, even something as simple as remote desktop, without uh, having it show up um, with, without having it show up in a way that uh, it would give away where the attacker was, right? So try to divert away, divert what's actually happening and show something else. So in this case, you know, we, yeah, we'll, go ahead. Yeah, we just, we'll, we'll go ahead and demo it because you know, we'll just kind of see what happens. Um, so like on this box, we can make an RDP connection to it. And so from our attacker machine, Probably faster just, oh wait, on box. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Tyrell Wallach, he's an admin of the box. So we're gonna use his account to remote desktop in. Oh, my bad. Thank you. Let's try it now. Boom, all right. So we're gonna go ahead and use this account to log in to this machine. So obvious, obviously this assumes some, some level of compromise on that host and what you're trying to do is persist on that host and get log in continually or be able to log in when someone else is logged in in order to do something. So 
Uh, fr from our perspective, what we're trying to do is run something that would allow us to, to connect to a victim machine and uh, divert the traffic. So report something that isn't actually happening, um, change some of those IP addresses so that if someone were to look at that, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't uh, directly give away where the attacker machine was coming from. Yeah. So just to kind of like show, as far as RDP logins, we don't have anything in the last 15 minutes. So we're going to go ahead and get on this machine. It takes a minute. So again, this is, this is focused at a network layer, right? So we're still doing an authentication. We still are using remote desktop. Um, and this is something that is going to occur. It's going to create some sort of authentication log. It, it just, it is from an authentication perspective. Um, the way that this tool has been implemented. But that doesn't mean that that's what's going to show up when you look at the network connections, right? So we have a valid remote desktop connection. Let's see what it says about our connection. It's kind of small, isn't it? Right here. So here's our remote desktop connection. Oh, what do you know? It's all loopback. So our 147 remote desktop in the machine from 147 into 146, and it shows loopback traffic. Now, cool, but what did the log say? Okay, moment of truth. Are we caught? No. So the logs in Windows that we go up to the central logging service said somebody authenticated with RDP on loopback 127. I'm sorry, what was that? Is, the question was, is loopback a, re, a requirement or can you set something else, right? And so that's going, going back to the... Yeah, go for it. Going, going back to it, right now we've set, we've set the, the loopback as the IP address, but this could be set to anything. Um, and additionally, what we'd like to do is try to chain agents together. It's a to-do, so that essentially you could issue a command and it'd go through a series of agents to get to where it needed to be and create, it, what you could end up doing is creating a bunch of Chaos. Chaos, essentially, <laughs> as, you, as, as the agents work together. So it's on our to-do, but the, the, from our perspective, the thing that's awesome is uh, when you, since everyone's relying on these event logs for, for their monitoring, if the event logs start lying to you, at that point, do you really know where the attacker is coming from, right? If everything's coming from the loopback, it's going to require some sort of host-based forensics. then it would show his legitimate IP address. Because we're able to maintain state between our connections. So just like TCP does, we're able to track sequence acknowledgement numbers with the offsets of the payload size. And so we're able to track that, keep state, and make sure that if a legitimate person tries to RDP in, go in over SMV, we're not taking, or even internal SMV traffic, we're not taking that traffic and causing downtime. So, so yeah. So, yeah, so I, the, the, the model, the deployment model. And, and the question was, how can we differentiate between legitimate and illegitimate traffic? Right. It's for, <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, the way that's like the, we did it is that the pro, like the current version of the program, it has a uh, command line interface, so you can specify who the attacker IP address is. But in a, again, like this is under active development. We're uh, oh, and also all the traffic is fully encrypted with the S two fifty six. Please scrutinize how it's been implemented because that's typically, you know, like there's been a lot of like. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. So anyway, the back door that we showed at the very beginning is encrypted and. Um, the way that it's uh, implemented now for the proxy is you can define 
what the attacker IP addresses is. So in a future version and release and stuff, what we're planning on doing is basically making an authenticated or encrypted uh, like configuration control over UDP so that if we need to change the IP address that the attacker is going to be coming from, if we need to have multiple IPs, multiple instances, we can control that uh, stealthily over that. Yeah, yeah, and that's and we're maintaining state like that with and that's how we're able to track it, so that we don't cause downtime for people that are legitimately logged in. So no, there's another question. Oh yeah, I'm really glad you asked that because that was kind of a pain. Because the same thing. So the the question was, <laughs> would it, would you be able to pull the attacker's IP address out of memory? Um, to, so, to try to recover where the attacker is. Yeah, and the same thing, that, and the same question we asked for the password. You know, it's, it's Python, so Dell, the variable, does not work. So we have in the, like, we have a function in there that uses the C types, and we calculate the offset of the variable for the password. I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the IP, because we can do that too. But the password specifically, we calculate the offset, and then we use the C types, you know, mem to overwrite memory directly so that whenever it spins up, the password's not in memory. And that's one thing like, we literally want to make sure of. So I'm so glad you mentioned that too. Could, oh yeah, we can do could, anything. Yeah, in yeah. theory you should be able to overwrite and it. And the other thing is right now we're actively moving this to C as well. And so, because I like this way more because you more control. Because it's already configured. So whenever the service starts and it's running, then it's already there. So the traffic, we're using the PBK as, it's basically the key derivative, or derivation. And so whenever it gets the derivation of it, then it'll have the hash there, but it won't have the plain text. So we're using the key derivation versus just, you know, plain text password. Question. Oh, well. Because you still have to authenticate. So the authentication shows up. And so the other thing is that it kind of gives us an advantage because if they have a bunch of traffic logging into this jump box from, let's say, you know, legitimate admin's workstation, we can use that same technique to show that it's on loopback to make it look like it's coming from that machine. So we can make it look like we're coming from somewhere that we're actually not, which is a pretty big advantage. Yeah, yeah, what was it? <laughs> can you use the snoop for other connections? We're operating the, at the same level as the Windows advanced firewall, right? I mean, we can do whatever we want with the traffic, anything. And it's all open source, so yeah. feel free to add. We'll, we'll gladly take any help. Yeah. And here's actually kind of the, uh, a little bit of the logic behind the, the spoofing of the loopback. It was kind of like an accident, that this, but anyway, so what happens is that we have like our filter set up, we know where the attacker's coming from, and so what we do is this, we change source destination, but the other thing is that we have to change it from, you know, like the, the, you know, the standard like WLAN interface or the you know, easier or whatever it's interface to basically the loopback interface. So that's one thing. We change the interface and then we have to change whether it's inbound or outbound. This was the weird part, maybe you guys knew about it, but for loopback traffic, it's always outbound. So whether or not we're sending it inbound, like we're spoofing inbound, it's outbound. And then whenever we're spoofing, you know, back out to the attacker, it's outbound. So in WinDivert and PyDivert, you can set the direction of the traffic. And so it's important here for the loopback specifically that the direction both ways is outbound. And then it works, because otherwise it doesn't work. And it's going to be a huge, it's a huge headache. But then, yeah, so that was kind of the key thing. Why don't we jump to the next demo? Okay. We can just talk through for the. So the, you know, an, another piece that we wanted to try to incorporate into the tool. This is great. You can use native tools. You can PS exec in, but 
Um, can you use it as a platform in, in order to run certain scripts? So uh, specifically, we're typically focused on trying to get passwords out of machines to try to find the machine that we're after. Um, so ultimately, if we have a tool where we can't use it to run PowerShell or uh, run commands at, at command line, then we're the the util the usefulness of the tool becomes uh, a moot point, really. Right. Yeah. So what what we've what we've done, and this this could you can pretty much do whatever you want, is we've just chain we've we've created a essentially like a PowerShell shell, so that you can access either the shell itself, you know, the cmd.exe or PowerShell. And run and call PowerShell and essentially run whatever commands you're after. Yeah. So we're just going to kind of go ahead and show that. And let's just make sure that we're connected. Yeah. So we're system. So just to kind of show, like, so here's the distinction between, like, if you want to do shell, then it's going to be like that way. And then just to do, you know, PowerShell, it's just pshell. And this is, I don't know if this is like messy or not, but either way. So I need to speak to this really quick. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. And talk so it like this. Uh, obviously we're using the the download cradle and we're hard linking uh, invoke Mimikatz. So don't do that. Host your own and don't yeah. don't don't so don't pull call from the this GitHub directly. Repo. But <laughs> for probably demo, obviously for demo bit. purposes, we just wanted to show that this is something that we're we're pulling you know from some other source that is outside of us. So sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it that way. Don't do from the GitHub. <laughs> okay, cool. So now we have creds. So invoke me cats. Oh and let's let's see we're running and this is running PowerShell version five with full logging too. So Uh, so the question was, is the driver spawning a PowerShell process? And, and in this case, what we're doing, just as a proof of concept, is just calling PowerShell. Yeah. yeah. There it is. So, we can hard screenshots that way. And obviously, with this level of access to you know the network traffic on a machine, any sort of plain text protocols, you know, that we, we obviously have complete access to that. Good. So, let me skip. so ultimately, what we'd like to do is passively harvest credentials from clear text services that may be running on something. So, in some cases, we know someone's authenticating using. Uh, telnet, like a, a network admin may be monitoring his switches. Believe it or not, telnet's still around. Um, so what we'd like to do is try to implement some sort of passive monitoring to extract credentials out of what's actually occurring. And at the same time, another thing that we'd like to do is implement some sort of key logger. Which is pretty trivial. So, yeah. Time check. <laughs> yes, really. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a number of initiatives in place. Yeah, so I mean, like one thing is like we really want to move it to C because like, like like the, we started out is that we can do all of that in Python. That was all Python, um, but you kind of get to a point where just like you know clearing stuff out of memory, having that lower level of control, um, even you know doing like some debugging, you know mitigation and uh, sandboxing stuff. It's really it's doing it in C has benefits, and so with the Wind Divert API in C. It's actually not that difficult to really port it over. So the really good thing is in Python, we can prototype this stuff. And, oh, yeah, this actually does work. We're able to do this thing. And then we can spend the time going into it and making a really stable thing in C. Plus, also, the whenever in C uh, supports asynchronous I.O. So, you know, for, like, speeding up, it's, like, it's really good. Um, what, one of the things we've kind of tossed around is, um, you, you know, when we set these network connections, setting them to arbitrary IP addresses, or make, making them look like legitimate, making them look like DNS traffic, you know, uh, between a, 
a domain, making it look like it was DNS traffic to a domain controller, which is often a DNS server, or setting it to IPv6 addresses, because we know everyone looks at IPv6. <laughs> Right, so who one understands the addressing? Like, so trying <laughs> trying to hide or blend in with the environment more. So there's a lot of to dos, but um, it works in its current state as as some sort of you know command and control um, at at a kernel driver level. Yeah, and just to kind of follow up, like whenever it fully supports IPv6. So if we want to do the IPv6 loopback. That would be even less obvious. Yeah. And so, a lot of IEDSs don't support IPv6. So what you know, what does this require in terms of dependencies? Really, it, it's just a, a couple of packages which you can pull down with pip. Um, and then PyCrypto has a reliance on the C++ compiler um, for Python. And uh, to roll your own exe, this is this, if you were to go to the GitHub and pull it down, <clears throat> this is all you need to do. So you could set your own passwords. You could hard code your own passwords if you wanted into it, change it out. Obviously, you can have a flag to overwrite some of that, but uh, that's that's really what you need in order to to deploy. It, it's it's literally that simple. And then um, from a and it's standalone. So it pulls all of the DLLs and the drivers and stuff into into a standalone binary. So it's extremely portable. And if you don't trust our WinDivert DLL and Sys, you can uh, your own. you can it's open source, so you can build your own as well. So that and this is all on the GitHub page, but it's to show that there aren't like you're not walking into a never-ending <coughs> dependency hallway, you know, where you don't see light at the end of the tunnel. This is literally the what you need. Um, f from a services perspective, we kind of talked about starting those services. This was this is literally just recapping, you know, how how you run run that AXC and set up some sort of service that would run. There's there's a number of ways you you pick how you want to persist, but I think we actually listed there and like some other things we were talking about, but time wise, but yeah, the service is great because we can start it and it shows that it failed to start, but it's actually running. And so if someone's like, oh, is that a suspicious service? And they go to look at it, oh, it's not running. So, yeah. So, from a a defense and and detection perspective, yeah, you can certainly look at the the authentication activity to try to find real abnormal use cases, um, where where you would show some sort of persistence is 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 in the implementation or the 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 use of the exe. Um, in order to establish some sort of persistence. So you're looking for process creation or something that's registered um, on the host-based operating systems. Uh, right now, the way it's implemented, whatever commands you execute on the underlying host operating systems, for example, PowerShell in that example, you would still see that happening. It just wouldn't. You'd see someone ran Mimikatz and you'd see the commands, but you, it, it would be hard to Without hard to attribute it, hard to, a to attribute it attacker. to a specific attacker, yeah. um, and then at a network level, you can you can hide um, on a host, but you can't hide from network appliances. Now, that's actually a feature too. Yeah, it's yeah, so, so like one of the features too that we're going to talk about it because that was one of the big things. Like, okay, yeah, yeah we can lo hide from host-based traffic, but what about if someone's like actually looking at NetFlow data? You know, how can we you know possibly mess with that? And so. Because just like the loopback, we're able to change the source and destination IPs and the interface and everything, we can actually hop around and make it where it's like whenever it sends the response from the target back to us, the you know the source address actually isn't the target that we're attacking. And so we can like dissociate IPs from all over the place. And because we're controlling the traffic, we're handling the connection from the client side, once we have that implemented, we can really make it look like whatever we want. So uh, that that's really it. This is not yet public, but we'll 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 do it today. flip it today. We promise. <laughs> uh, we just forgot to do it before the presentation. Um, and then feel free to reach out to us with any questions. We'll 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 pause now if you have any questions. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much. We really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thanks.
Cool. Appreciate it. So the question was is basically disassociating like or changing the source IP whenever we're coming back to our client to make it look like it's coming from somewhere else. Yeah, we, we've been testing that and one of the first things was the loopback. But whenever we put that on the wire and we change the, the source, typically it would just be like, oh, RST because it doesn't show that stable connection. But since we control the client and the server, we can maintain that stable connection by implementing it ourselves. The sequence acknowledgement numbers, you know, and then the payload size. And, and also the really cool thing about this is that you have control over, you know, you can implement your own protocol if you want to. I mean, so like we can, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Exactly. And we're trying to yeah. make like a socket, yeah. a socket import. So it's basically like a wind divert socket. That's what we're trying to work on. So basically, whenever you go to develop something, you can import it just like you would a Python socket. It's like import sockets. And you can develop your own modules without having to worry about the TCP uh, handling because it's already done in a library. Which would be cool. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And any other questions? Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.